this last section, section six, is looking forward. What do we see? And we have panelists, Bobby Hutchinson, Delmar Land and Litter Ch Challenge, Louise Lawrence, Chief Office of Resource Conservation for MDA, Kristen Hughes-Evans, Sustainable Chesapeake, and our uh, Hughes Center board member, Verna Harrison of Verna Harrison's Associates. Thank you. <laughs> it is my pleasure to be here. You have their resumes in your um, package of material, but this is a really fine panel and they bring a whole lot of experience and so I'm delighted to be able to turn it over to them. We're going to start with Bobby and uh, Bobby who needs no introduction other than the fact that he's probably on more boards than most farmer people uh, in the state but he joins me as the on the board of the Agroecology Center. He's the treasurer. So Bobby. Good afternoon. I'm Bobby Hutchison, a farmer from Talbot County. I farm gr uh, grain and, and vegetables. And if any of you haven't had your nap this afternoon, now's the time for two reasons. Number one, most of my speech has already been given. And number two, the other panelists are much smarter and much better looking than me, so. <laughs> I'm going to talk to you about the land and litter challenge, and you've heard a lot about that today. Where I might be a little bit different is I'm going to give you some of the background of how it got started and how it evolved into the land and litter challenge. And it started sometime four to five years ago when Ernie Shea, Ernie Shea was uh, financed by the Keith Campbell Foundation to see if there could be a, a solution to the litter problem. And he started out by going out and interviewing a lot of different industry people and getting their thoughts on it and to see whether they would be willing to work on the issue. As a result of that, there was a group of about 10 or 15 people at the original meeting in the question that we kind of asked ourselves, is the problem solvable? And we come back with yes, we thought it was. I like the concept because it was the first group that I had been a part of that looked at it from a regional basis or all of Delmarva. We didn't look at it just as Delaware or Maryland or Virginia. And I thought that was huge, that it is an industry-wide thing and we needed to be working together on it. I also like the fact that we were looking for a solution and it was a broad-based group. And I like, you know, win-win situations. And it was being proactive instead of reactionary, which we had been up to this point. So I said the group thought the problem was solvable, so we decided that we would move ahead and we called ourselves the Kitchen Cabinet under Ernie's leadership. The group continued to grow as we brought in more experts. And I think it grew to about 45, 40 to 45, and we found that that was unmanageable, but at that point, it quit being the steering, excuse me, the kitchen cabinet and become the steering committee. And was facilitated by Ernie and three co-chairs, Andrew McLean, Bob Gallagher, and myself. We determined that land application was the best short-term use of litter. And alternative uses are out there, but at this point, there's not any quite ready that could, could solve our problem for the next two or three years when the PMT kicks in and there's more manure that needs to be moved. But some questions had to be answered. Is there enough land with low enough p-values to take all the, the litter? Where is the extra litter? And if we're going to have to transport this litter, what are the drawbacks to transporting it? 
So three work groups were formed. The Transport Committee, which you've heard about, which Kim Coble and Bill Massey were chairs. The Mass Balance, which Beth talked about this morning. She was a co-chair along with Kelly Shank and Ed Key. The Innovative Solutions, <clears throat> which you're gonna hear more about with Bob Monley and Kristen Hughes Evans here. I told you our, our steering committee got rather large and we're in the process of transitioning right now into a steering committee with 27 members and it's going to be led by an executive committee of seven individuals. Andrew McLean is chairman of that executive committee. Bob Gallagher is a vice chair. I'm a vice chair. Amy Jacobs, Jeff Horseman, Mike Phillips, and Bob Frazee make out the rest. We have recently formed a communications committee and they are working The Transport Committee, as reported earlier, has come out with a recommendation and passed it on to the three State Departments of Agriculture. And that's kind of our version of what we think a preferred process should look like. Uh, some suggestions may be taken and some may not. The mass balance turned out to be much more complicated than we first thought and has, has extended and taken some time in the, in the final stages, and I think we're gonna be very uh, satisfied to have those numbers out there that, that we can all agree on. The Innovative Solutions is ongoing. They're continuing to evaluate things. Kristen will tell you more about that. Communications is working to get our message out. And when we started this kitchen cabinet, I thought it might be a two-year process. And we kind of had three goals, thought we would get that, and then we would ride off into the sunset. But in the process, we gathered together such a unique group of individuals that wanted to work together, wanted to find uh, solutions, that we've decided to continue on in the Land and Litter Challenge was created and looks like it's going to move, continue on for a while. It's been a pleasure to work with, this, with such a diverse and talented group. And I want to thank Ernie Shea and Bob Wood from the Keith Campbell Foundation, because without their work at the start of this, I don't think this would have ever happened. I don't have any materials here today, but um, yeah. Nancy, excuse me, Nancy, told me that uh, she's going to put a link when the video or, or the, the wrap-up of this, there'll be a link to our website. One thing I want to leave you with, it was said kind of earlier by Jenny, litter, it's valuable, slow-release, organic fertilizer, and it's a saleable commodity. Thank you. Good afternoon. I congratulate you on being uh, diligent and staying to the bitter end. Yeah. And um, so I know I was stiff, so if you feel that you need to stand up, I won't be offended. Um, we have run a program at MDA. My name is Louise Lawrence. Um, since uh, 2014, fiscal year 2014, to look at animal waste technologies that might be innovative and could uh, repurpose the use of uh, manure. And so um, we've issued an RFP. Uh, this is the fourth year um, that we've issued one. And what we've looked at, um, or looked for, is uh, proven technologies. We don't want to be doing funding research that might be a good concept. We've seen countless pictures and countless concepts um, that are better than sliced bread and solve all our problems. And um, we can all go home and count ourselves uh, successful. But uh, at the end of the day, um, we tried to hone down what things we needed to see in these demonstration projects. 
And so we wanted to have um, somebody who already had identified uh, farmers and or sources for litter and um, sites have been secured for where the project's gonna occur. We don't wanna get into zoning debates or other debates um, after we funded a project. Uh, we wanted technologies that addressed uh, nutrient issues, so we didn't want just technologies that uh, burned litter and uh, the problem went into the air and they didn't know, know how it fat, fit in the context of um, Maryland's nutrient management issues and Chesapeake Bay nutrient reduction uh, goals and those kinds of things. Um, we wanted to make sure that whoever was pitching uh, the project had at least three years experience or they had retained expertise of somebody who had worked with the technology for at least three years. We didn't wanna pay somebody to uh, educate themselves about what they were doing. Um, and uh, the concept was that they would say, uh, they would commit to installing the project in one year and uh, we would have third party monitoring with uh, typically an academic institution to have an uh, objective uh, review of how the outcomes occurred and whether they were successful and whether they were uh, economically viable. And so uh, Hans put this up in a nanosecond, but this is uh, that same slide pretty much. Um, these were the first four projects we funded, uh, fiscal year 14. They actually had contracts in the fall of uh, 15, I guess it was. Uh, we, so um, two of them are composting projects and two of them related to poultry litter. I, I'm gonna sort of gloss over the composting projects um, and concentrate on the poultry litter projects, obviously, because that's why we're here talking about poultry. Um, so you can see how much money uh, we invested. The idea was um, to act as a, a startup and not to fund the full um, project, that we would look for projects that had some leverage that they brought to the table. Oops. So uh, this is the one composting project. The reason I put it up here is just to talk about um, composting in general. It is a potential um, opportunity in the poultry industry as well, and some people do in-house composting between flocks, so it is um, proven. I want to apologize, I'm having a <coughs> coughing issue. <coughs> so the um, composting project um, we funded, one was on a dairy farm and one was um, on a horse farm. Thank you. And um, they did do a pretest using um, poultry litter with mixed with horse manure, and they kind of complemented each other and uh, resulted in an opportunity that worked in terms of uh, technology outcomes, but um, that was not really the ones that we funded. Thank you. <laughs> I have all kinds of mints here now. Um, so that's kind of what it looks like. It's an, what they call an in-vessel composter. And um, if I can, this thing right here moves back and forth and um, pushes the compost back and forth in the auger, uh, stirs it up so it has air. Um, they can run it remotely. And you can see it's contained in a, a small structure. So um, both those projects uh, ran for a year and they've been completed and we hope to have results on them for anyone who's interested on our website in the next couple months. And so um, to get into the poultry litter ones, um, the first one I'm gonna talk about is up and operational. It's been operational since December. So I have the most information and um, some pictures related to that one. And it utilizes um, poultry litter from eight houses that are on site. They actually have 16, but um, their MD permit allows them to use uh, litter from on-site ones, which reduced it to eight. It's a combustion process. It's called fluidized bed combustion, where they um, suspend the materials and they add a lot of more air to it, so it burns more efficiently. And the uh, demonstration would be to heat two houses uh, with the heat generated from combustion 
and to have two of the houses that are controls that are heated in the normal fashion using propane and to look at the outcomes. Uh, this technology um, has been used in uh, a few times in Europe and the outcomes there um, talk about improved bird health and um, accelerated bird growth. So the uh, concept was that you could have uh, use the literature uh, actually help with your production system and uh, have a saleable end product um, which is this high phosphorus ash. Um, and so right now they are in the process of um, registering the ash as a soil amendment and looking for markets for that. Um, they are wrapping up the heating of uh, two houses for one flock right now. The first flock was sort of a um, getting the kinks out kind of thing. Let's see if I have. So this is a schematic of um, the thing, and it's not of the setup, but you can see that the, um, so the energy center is over here, and um, this is where the manure is fed from, and the heat comes across to, I think, the second and fourth house. I don't know why this one, there's a house here too. That's the site, and I'll show you a couple other pictures um, in a minute. So the instrumentation's on two houses. Uh, they've calibrated it uh, over one flock, and they're getting ready to complete their first flock uh, uh, fully running. Uh, we're still working out some of the monitoring kinks, but University of Maryland is doing a um, system performance and nutrient budget monitoring, and the Environmental Finance Center is looking at the cost effectiveness of it um, from several uh, from a farm context and from a life cycle analysis and from a, uh, they might get a little bit into the regional context, um, but that is sort of dependent on the information we can get out of the system. So this is another schematic of um, the system. Uh, again, whoops, sorry. So, um, this is uh, the manure that comes into the system is right here. Um, and this is the energy center. This is where it's combusted here. Uh, the heat comes from here. And uh, these are the control areas. And a couple of these are in separate rooms, but um, that's sort of the schematic. So that's, uh, they took a traditional uh, poultry litter storage shed and uh, we allowed them to do a conversion. So. Um, the right side is the traditional storage, and on the left side, they have a, a come along thing that brings the manure right uh, into uh, a hopper that then uh, transfers it into the combustion area. Um, so on the, on the left is the, uh, the unit that shows fluidized bed combustion, and on the, um, well, it's two different views of it, actually. Um, and you can see the generator and the hot water um, tank that uh, is used, it heats up and then it flows into the poultry houses to heat the poultry houses. So um, that one, as I said, uh, still has, it'll be operational at least through December, maybe through next February, depending on um, how the weather cooperates or doesn't cooperate. We were hoping for a cold weather longer this year so that we could continue to heat another flock, but that's not happening this year. It got warm very soon, so we only did one flock really. Um, we'd like to do at least three flocks uh, during the heating season. They do want to operate it um, in the summer to just look at uh, reduced humidity and whether that uh, improves bird health as well since they've got quote unquote free heat, uh, they want to see how it pans out. Um, what I would say that a little bit different than Europe is that we don't have in the U.S. the um, renewable resource subsidy market for electricity generation that they do in Europe. So it doesn't, it needs to pencil out a little bit differently in the U.S. It needs to pencil out using um, flock improvements and perhaps the sale of um, the byproducts, the ash. Um, the second project uh, that we funded um, back in 14 uh, is still not operational. Uh, they've had a lot of glitches along the way. Um, they are located in Worcester County. Uh, they are going to use a mesophilic uh, anaerobic digester and um, link it with a nutrient capture system. And so it's traditional anaerobic digestion. Uh, 
but it's with poultry litter, which as you all know, it's not very moist, so they're adding some water to the process. But once they add water, they're not gonna have to continue uh, to add water every cycle. Uh, the idea is that they will be able to recycle that uh, moist content throughout the system and just uh, add incremental amounts, but not uh, discharge and not have to add huge amounts of water. They are using the poultry litter from uh, six houses that are on site. Their concept is really to do a regional system, which uh, draws from several poultry operations in the area. Uh, the nutrient capture system, which I neglected to explain, uh, is just a system for extracting uh, both the phosphorus and the potash uh, from, the, from the system and um, breaking it into constituents that could be saleable items and or could be used on the existing farm. Uh, that farm has an, several hundred acres, so it's a grain farm, so they, get, they have the opportunity to use some of that on site as part of this demo. If it were to scale up, then they would look, I think, at excelling some of the product. Um, so the slurry goes, uh, produces methane, and they, uh, it's, a lot of it's a parasitic load. It, it powers the whole system that, that it operates. Uh, they, they expect to have a little bit of electricity to sell back to the grid, but that's not a big part of their um, business plan. Uh, and the particulate fraction um, creates, as I said, phosphorus and it removes ammonia. And they anticipate that the uh, byproduct will be um, either uh, N to P ratio of four to uh, one or five to one. So it, it helps a little bit in terms of um, some of the phosphorus issues on the, on the shore. So um, I think I've covered all, all this already. Uh, they hope to be operational. This is a schematic of it. It's not very good. Um, you don't see the scale. Uh, I have not been out there and taken pictures. I've been out there a number of times, but uh, for whatever reason, I've not taken pictures. It's quite large. Um, the anaerobic digestion is, I think there's more than four tanks. I think there's six, in fact. But um, anyway, I'm going to move on because I'm running out of time and you're looking at your watch. Um, I have gone over that. So the next uh, group of projects that were just funded in the fall of 16, um, so again, one of them is a compost system. It's a little bit different. It's type of composting and it's going to be um, demonstrated in Anne Arundel using mostly horse manure. Um, the second one is called Chesapeake Bay Renewables and it's in Somerset County and it's a much larger regional facility. And so they are similar to Planet Found in that they're using anaerobic digestion, they're using a higher temperature anaerobic digestion called thermophilic and um, they anticipate generating uh, 48 megawatt hours per day of electricity. Um, they're going to sell, sell approximately 90% of the electricity to the grid. Uh, they use a little bit for parasitic load. It is, uh, the concept is to use it as a regional facility and so they want to be processing 80 tons of poultry litter a day. They have worked with a manure broker to uh, secure the uh, supply of feedstock to do that. And um, they anticipate breaking ground in June. Uh, they, the facility, uh, the department, or the state is providing 1.4 million, but their leverage is about 15 million from investors, so it's a very expensive process um, that they've undertaken, and they are currently going over the public service, um, service commission's uh, requirements to get approval to generate electricity. And that's, uh, an example of what one of the digester tanks would look like. Um, they're in an industrial park in Somerset County. They're not on a farm. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. In introducing Louise was someone that probably needs no introduction also because she's been around and working both in the agricultural and environmental community for many years. So our next speaker is going to talk to us about some innovations, and whereas Bobby's a farmer and Louise is a quote-unquote bureaucrat, Kristen operates in the interface and with the public. So welcome, Kristen. Um, I, 
it's really great to be here and to be talking about the future. Um, and I am not an expert in the future, um, but when you're working with agriculture and bringing new and innovative solutions, you're looking to the future because farmers don't do anything quickly. I mean, there is enough risk with farming um, just in the day-to-day -day operation that when you're talking about making a change, um, a big change in how they're managing their farm or how they're managing manure, um, you're talking about doing that over a long period of time. So um, we work with uh, you know a handful of farmers that are willing to go and do something different, and these guys are paving the way for the rest of the industry because most folks um, are going to need to see something work, and they're going to need to see it work for a long time before they're going to consider um, adopting it on their farm. So um, anyways, I'm, I'm excited to be here. And there's a lot of really amazing things happening in agriculture. Um, and I think we have a lot to be optimistic about when we look to the future. And we have a lot of challenges. Um, so just um, thinking about um, a few things, uh, it's great to come last because a lot of things have already been talked about. Uh, and. And I want to touch on some things that we don't normally think of as being uh, affiliated with water quality, but that have environmental impacts. Um, I'm going to talk about things like consumer demand, which has come up before, um, antibiotic-free production, which has also been talked about earlier, um, and, the, and the impact potentially on Chesapeake Bay water quality issues. I'm going to talk about climate change and how that's impacting the poultry industry and how that might in turn translate to water quality impacts. And then I'm going to close with talking about phosphorus sustainability issues that we're going to be dealing with um, globally in the future and, and also how that could impact water quality. So you've heard a number of people talk about consumer demand and I, I just am blown away by this and just to give you an example of um, and how agriculture is responding to this. I read an article in Poultry World yesterday, and if you're at all affiliated with the poultry industry, you probably get this publication in your email on a daily basis. And the article was um, a company that was talking about marketing to the millennial generation. And the article pointed out that millennials, and these are folks that are born from the 1980s to the mid-1990s, are one of the most educated, one of the most culturally diverse generations yet. And they're very socially connected. They're connected to the environment and they care where their food is coming from. Um, two thirds of them closely read food labels and agriculture is paying attention to this. And we are seeing tremendous changes across the production sector. I mean, we're seeing companies like General Mills making claims, uh, you know, saying we're gonna, we're gonna purchase all GMO free grains. I mean, that's, that's a huge shift. Um, and we're seeing um, and we're seeing farmers paying attention to that. Oh, just since the election where we've had a shift in the administration and environmentalists are asking you know EPA questions like are, are we going to ha even have EPA? We're hearing from farmers, you know what, even if EPA pulls back on regulations, we still have to produce a product for consumers and consumers are paying attention to environmental issues. They're paying attention to animal welfare issues. So we can expect consumer demand to continue influencing the way food is produced in the future. This is a trend that will probably continue in the future years. It's, it's new in, in my lifetime um, and something that we can expect to see in the future. Um, so along those lines, I want to talk about antibiotic-free poultry because this has come up a couple of times, but there are environmental impacts associated with this, both potentially positive and negative. And I've got a picture of McNuggets up here because you have corporations like McDonald's talking about, hey, we're going to try to get our, our chicken from, from companies that produce antibiotic-free chicken. So, I mean, big companies are making pledges to try to shift towards antibiotic-free poultry purchasing and Tyson's and Purdue are examples of integrators who have gotten on board with this. Um, and I, this is a tremendous challenge for the industry. Um, and I, and I want to talk a little bit about why that's so and why there are um, environmental impacts. So Doug earlier talked about ammonia emissions. Um, and we had a, a, another grower earlier today, I think Katie was talking, she's an antibiotic free and Andrew produces organically. So we heard from some of these growers. So we have a model for how to produce birds without antibiotics because growers are already doing it successfully now. 
Um, and one of the key things these growers are doing is they're t paying a lot of attention to in-house air quality. So when we think about growing a lot of birds in one location, I mean, really it makes sense to just go ahead and give them antibiotics, right? Because if one bird gets sick, it's gonna just spread like wildfire through the whole flock. So we really have to take a lot of focus on preventative measures. So keeping that air quality in the house at a really good level starts to become really important. And so organic growers and antibiotic-free growers have been doing this. But when we think about indoor air quality from a production perspective, we start thinking about ammonia emissions because ammonia emissions are very closely correlated with production. If ammonia is high in the house, we start to see production problems. We see bird health problems. Birds become more susceptible to bacterial and viral infections. And of course, uh, Doug mentioned earlier that ammonia emissions are something the environmental community is paying attention to. So farmers are starting to look at things um, that improve indoor air quality and, and they're doing things like ventilating more. So ventilating more um, is just getting better, more airflow through the house. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that we learned from growers is that organic growers use between two, two and three times more propane in the winter than conventional growers because they're ventilating more. Um, so that has some potential negative implications for the environment. I mean, any time we use fossil fuels, not only are we releasing fossil carbon, but we're re releasing fossil nitrogen into the atmosphere. Um, but there are other things that growers can do to reduce ammonia emissions in the house. Um, they can start paying attention to the way they manage litter. So most growers on the Delmarva use some kind of poultry litter treatment. That's a, a chemical treatment that helps bind ammonia emissions and keep it in the poultry litter so it doesn't get released into the atmosphere. Um, growers are also working on keeping the litter dry and keeping moisture levels down in the house. These things help improve um, reduce the likelihood that ammonia will be released from the poultry litter. Um, the photo shows an innovative heating system that heats a poultry house with hot water instead of with propane. Every time you burn propane in a house for heat, you release moisture. Well, moisture in a house is an air quality problem. Um, it can facilitate ammonia emissions. Well, a dry heat helps keep the litter dry and it can help keep ammonia levels down. So anyways, my point is here that there are potential benefits to the environment by focusing on reducing ammonia emissions in the house. And I think we're gonna start seeing um, innovative technologies that can help growers do this. This is a challenging problem. There are, there are no silver bullets on the, solution, on the horizon that I can see to just instantly reduce ammonia emissions in, in poultry houses. But as we start focusing on this more, um, because we're shifting more to antibiotic free production, I think we will um, start to see a, a correlating environmental benefit because we'll start to see reduced ammonia emissions from poultry houses. So the other thing I want to talk about is climate change um, and climate change impacts on the poultry industry. Um, so one thing that we need to think about when we think about growing any kind of animal is where do the greenhouse gas emissions come from? And for animal agriculture, I mean, a lot of people think of, okay, greenhouse gas emissions are coming from things like the animals breathing or from, um, you know, energy used on the farm or from dairy cow flatulence or it's actually the feed used to produce animals that produces the most greenhouse gas footprint. Um, and one thing that we have done really well here in the United States is to, ha is to reduce the feed conversion efficiency of poultry. Um, and so uh, maybe somebody can explain to me why Eastern Europe is beating the United States in, feed con in, in greenhouse gas emissions per chicken weight. but. From this chart that I got from a food and agricultural organization report, it looks like the United States or North America is second across the globe in terms of greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of chicken weight produced. I, I, and again, I'm confused at why Eastern Europe is the lowest. That's interesting. But anyways, a couple of the reasons why we're doing so well. One, we tend to not have to take down forests to produce soybeans, which is a big source of greenhouse gas emissions in other areas of the world. And two, because big integrators have done so well at 
feed conversion. So in the U.S., we're, we have feed conversion efficiencies below two to one, um, which is which is incredible, and that really goes to um, why we have such a low carbon footprint for for our poultry. And if we look at the trends in information and in genetics and the data that's produced and what it, the industry is doing with that data. I mean, at some point I would imagine we're gonna hit a wall where we just can't get any lower, but hopefully we will continue improving in feed conversion efficiency um, because that has really positive environmental impacts. It has a greenhouse gas impact, but it also has a manure management benefit, right? Because if we have poor feed conversion efficiency, if the bird is not converting that feed into bird weight, guess where it's going? It's going out the back end. So all the improvements that we get in feed conversion translate to less manure produced per bird. So again, positive benefits here at home. So related to carbon footprint and feed conversion, I want to focus on reducing N2O emissions. Nitrogen dioxide is agriculture's biggest greenhouse gas emissions. And this, again, comes from producing um, grain. And N2O emission is a, is a natural uh, function. Bacteria um, convert ammonia nitrogen into nitrite and nitrate which are all reactive forms, and then ultimately into N2 gas, which is non-reactive, which we're breathing right now. N2 makes up 70% of the atmosphere. Um, and then again, bacteria that live on the roots of legumes convert N2 into reactive nitrogen that plants can use as fertilizer. Um, so N2O emissions are really important from a greenhouse gas emissions perspective, though, because they are 300 times more potent of a greenhouse gas um, molecule than CO2. So that's why N2O is ag's biggest greenhouse gas footprint. And this relates to fertilizing. So it relates to nitrogen fertilizer. But this is an area which I really excited in the future about because we have major efforts around the country and right here in the Delmarva to become more efficient at using nitrogen fertilizer to grow crops. Um, so we're seeing um, big food companies, big ag groups partnering to bring state-of-the-art technologies to farms across the region. Here on the Eastern Shore, we've had initiatives that have been led by groups like the Maryland Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts and the Nature Conservancy. They formed a group called the 4R Alliance, which um, harnesses the expertise of nutrient management planners and agribusiness to bring these state-of-the-art technologies to farms here on the Eastern Shore. And what I'm talking about are technologies that help farmers just spoon feed nitrogen to the crop over the growing season. Um, and farmers are interested in these. I mean, there's growing demand for this type of technology. Um, the big farms are pretty much are probably already doing this, and so the, the goal now is to get this down to the smaller farms as well. Um, and so this kind of precision nutrient management, we can expect to get better and better at managing nitrogen in the, in the future, and that's going to reduce ag's greenhouse gas emissions, and then obviously that's going to have water quality benefits, because the less nitrogen laying around unused by the plant, the less nitrogen then we're going to lose to surface water, the less nitrogen we're going to lose to our groundwater. So really exciting stuff happening there around the country and then right here in the Delmarva as well. So I want to talk about phosphorus. Um, so phosphorus is an area where um, I get a little nervous about the future. Um, so one of my colleagues from Virginia Tech, um, Dr. Mark Ryder, is a soil fertility specialist and he actually went and visited the Florida phosphorus mines. We get most of our phosphorus in the United States from mines in Florida. And he kind of jokes, but it's almost literally true, we're kind of mining dinosaur bones down there. These are old, ancient sources of buried phosphorus. And he, he talk to these people and, and if you talk to them they will tell you they've already gotten the easy phosphorus out. Um, so they're mining uh, phosphorus re reserves that are difficult and more expensive to get now. So as far as U.S. phosphorus production goes, it, we are going to significantly diminish the amount of phosphorus that we can produce and sell within our lifetimes. Within most people in this room's lifetimes, we're going to be switching over to a major phosphorus importer in the United States. 
And this is huge, okay? So we have to have phosphorus to grow crops. Um, you all are probably familiar enough with agriculture to know that the big three nutrients are nitrogen, phosphorus, and potash. And, and there's no bacteria that can fix phosphorus from the atmosphere. We get it from the ground. Um, so looking at where the world's phosphorus reserves are, they are largely concentrated in a relatively small area of the world, in Morocco and in Western Sahara. So um, anyway, so this is something that, that's going to affect us, if not in your lifetime, then for sure in your children's lifetime. And the way it's going to affect us is that phosphorus is likely to become more expensive. Um, and so it is not going to become feasible to over apply phosphorus anymore. So some of the technologies that Louise talked about and that we mentioned earlier through the day that are capable of concentrating phosphorus, like the Minorta Energy technology that MDA is funding, um, these, uh, the economics of these are hard to pencil out now, but they may become more economically feasible in the future. And I get nervous about this because on one hand, this is good news for water quality. On the other hand, this is alarming for food production, right? Because cheap fertilizer means that we have low food prices and low food prices are good for us. We already have too many families that are food insecure. So, um, so anyways, this is one of those things where, yes, it's a benefit to water quality, but um, not necessarily good for many other reasons. So in general, that's, that's kind of some of the few things that I wanted to talk about. Um, I, I see positive trends in agriculture that, um, that will have that will have beneficial impacts on the Chesapeake Bay, um, and, and but you know we, we are going to be dealing with a lot of challenges. Great, thank you. Okay, this is for Louise. What's going on with the renewable oil project in Wicomico County? Um, that was a project that was um, approved for funding in. Uh, 2015, uh, they are stalled in making progress. Uh, we are evaluating their ability to continue uh, to actually implement that project. Right now, they have gone beyond the year requirement and they have not extended their contract, so we are negotiating with them as to what the end result will be of their project. So that project is in stall mode at the moment. And while questions are coming, Louise, what is the likelihood that the funding in the innovation pot will continue, and do you award it every year or every couple of years? Uh, we've um, gotten uh, $2.5 million uh, every year. For the last four years, we have the same amount of funding for uh, 2018. We are getting some of our funds from Maryland Energy Administration uh, this last two years. Uh, they have a funding source um, from the Exelon uh, Energy Settlement, and so we're getting $2 million, I believe. I don't have a contract yet in 18 for that, so in the short term, uh, we still have money, I think, um, maybe crystal balling it. I mean, we have had a lot of people come to the trough and not a lot of them meet our criteria, so unless we start getting some better projects, I'm not sure if we're going to tap out after five or 10 years or not. So um, right now, funding is not an issue, though. Uh, question, I guess, for anybody, but uh, Kristen, should the US create a strategic phosphorus reserve like we have a strategic petroleum reserve? That is a really good question. I, I don't know if we're there yet. Um, but we may be there in the future. There's, there's other things that we can be looking at uh, um, as well. We, can, we have um, technologies that can extract phosphorus sustainably from our surface waters. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of algal turf scrubbers. Um, these things are not necessarily economically feasible now, but they may be in the future. Um, we can start extracting phosphorus um, and using it more um, appropriately from our wastewater sources um, as well as our manure sources. So um, I don't know, but there are a lot of options out there that, that we're not using now because phosphorus is inexpensive. 
Another question, you all talked about some of the larger scale innovations. I think a while ago there were some small innovations maybe in other states, um, farm scale. Have they gone anywhere as far as alternative uses? Um, we've worked with some farmers around the region to demonstrate thermal manure to energy technologies. Um, and one thing that we saw was a challenge for all of them was to meet strict emissions requirements. But we are seeing progress. One of the technology vendors who's producing a technology at the lowest price range um, has made progress. And we did just recently see emissions data from them that looks like it would meet Maryland emissions thresholds. Um, but this is, this is an area, I think, that, that needs further work and where the Maryland Department of Agriculture's funding, I think, really helps um, bring these new technologies to the region. Um, even though they're still in the R&D phase and they may not, they may not make um, perfect economic sense now, again, we are laying the foundation for the future. And then there was a, a large-scale facility that was, I think, slated to be up and going in Pennsylvania. Whatever happened to that? Um, it was with... Um, Energy Works? Yeah. Yep. So, um, I think they are having economic issues. Uh, again, the economics of these facilities right now are a challenge. Um, so my understanding is that they are not operating on a daily basis now because the money just isn't working for them. Okay. Well, you've heard a lot um, from these folks and folks earlier about alternative use, whether it's on the farm in an appropriate fashion or in helping farmers improve their bottom lines. So I just want to thank the panel and uh, we'll look forward to um, hearing what you all think should be some of the next steps.